Well, ladies and gentlemen, Alan is not with me again, but whatever. I'll have coffee and he'll be over there. Hey, that's the come and take it mug. Do you know that today is the anniversary of the Battle of Gonzales fought on October 2nd, 1835, which started the Texas Revolution? I actually had no idea. Well, you know, there's a bit of a false narrative being spread right now about that very Texas Revolution. Well, I think we should have a conversation about it. So come and take it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Sons of History podcast. You're going to love it. This episode is going to be stellar because I'm Dustin Bass. And I'm Alan Joaquin. Yeah, thanks for uh, piping in. Unbelievable. Why are you not here again? Well, I had people over and the streets were flooded. I mean, my front, the, the, the street here, the streets surrounding me were all flooded. It had been raining really hard. I had people here. And they, they kind of stuck around until, I mean, they're, they're still here right now. So I didn't want to kick them out. And so here we are. You couldn't have gotten that yacht? Blame it on the weather. Blame it on the weather. Oh, dude, you totally missed an opportunity to say blame it on the rain. Uh, Remember the, it's a great song. It's a classic song. Eh, whatever. Blame it on the rain. All, All right, right really ladies like and gentlemen. that much. Well, it's a song regardless, uh, and so people should know it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, one, if you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, and if you're listening strictly on the podcast, subscribe, and if you would do us a favor, leave a rating and a review. That would be huge for us. All right, I want to give a quick update on my dad. I'm sure that uh, most of y'all, uh, well, at least a, a large portion of you know, especially if you're on Facebook and Instagram, that my dad had gotten COVID, gotten COVID pneumonia, was in the hospital for like two months, um, ended up writing an article about our experience dealing with with all of this. I uh, wrote an article for the Epic Times, uh, but he is out. He is back home. He is doing wonderfully well. Um, and thank you to all of our listeners and all of our supporters for for just praying and, and keeping our family in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, means a whole lot. All right, man. Um, looking forward to this conversation. Are you? Oh, yeah. And I'm really, really happy about your father. It's, yeah, I, I really am. I'm, I'm very, you know, I lost my father. I know what it's like. It's not a good feeling. You know, your father's with you your whole life. And then all of a sudden he's gone. It's a very surreal moment. Yeah. Yeah. And it started to feel very surreal there for a little while. God, it was very, um, as the Duke of Wellington would once say, a very close run thing. Um, it was, I mean, it, he was very close to death. I mean, the doctors were like, when we came to talk to them, they're like, look, man, well, man, woman, and man, because my brothers, my brother and my mom were there. They're like, either he can die here or he can die on the way to your house. That's the situation that we're in right now. And you talk about just a ton of prayer and God performed a miracle, no doubt about it. And thank you, Jesus, for, whew, man, uh, you talk about just, yeah, it was brutal. It was, it was not good. Um, but thank you very much for the sentiments, brother. I pray, greatly appreciate it. Um, and further sentiments this week in history. All right, so my uh, This Week in History is actually 150 years ago this October 8th, October 8th, 1871. It is the Great Fire of Chicago. Uh, it started out at the DeCoven Street Barn that belonged to Patrick and Catherine O'Leary. Um, now, the legend is that Miss O'Leary's cow kicked over a lantern and that started the fire and then it just blazed throughout for the next two days um, and it ended up killing around 300 people 
A hundred thousand people were left homeless. That's about a third of the population of Chicago at the time. Uh, the fire destroyed three and a half miles, um, square miles of property and like 17,500 buildings somewhere in there. Uh, and a financial loss of $200 million, which is equivalent to today's about $4 billion in damages. Uh, now, the fire, as I said, started on October 8th, didn't, didn't go out until October 10th. So two days of just a blazing inferno throughout the entire, uh, more or less the entire city of Chicago. Uh, now, speaking of Miss O'Leary's cow, that poor lady and that poor cow, in 1997, the Chicago City Council actually exonerated the cow and Miss O'Leary of everything that took place a little, a little late, a little late in the exoneration, um, maybe, but hey, at least uh, the name is is cleared. Uh, now, some of the other theories for how the fire got started is uh, vandals or a drunken neighbor, uh, milk thieves, and then there's also my favorite theory for the start of the fire, and actually it's my favorite theory for any start of any fire, uh, is uh, spontaneous combustion. Uh, that's just, uh, pretty interesting. Now, 22 years later, this is pretty interesting. 22 years later, this is how quickly the, the city recovered. 22 years later, the world's fair was hosted by Chicago. This book, uh, the devil in the white city by Eric Larson actually discusses, uh, that moment in time of Chicago hosting the world's fair. Uh, but I would like to say that a greater moment in American history than, than the fire, uh, was October 9th, 1981. Do you know what that is, Alan? No, I don't. Because I have a different, I have a, my own October of 1981. You're such a freaking idiot. Anyways, that's my birthday. That was? Yeah, October 9th, okay. 1981. Yeah, makes, sense. makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. Yeah. Yeah, my, my 30s are coming to an end. And speaking of coming to an end, my This Week in History is now at an end. Okay, so you're expecting me to speak now, huh? Is that it? I I just total totally flubbed your birthday. I didn't realize. Yeah, you know, it's like okay, yeah, forty years October nine. It's funny because something happened three days before your birthday, but I'll lead into that later on. All right. So now here's mine. Uh, this week in history, October six, nineteen seventy three, the Yom Kippur War. Now, uh, that was a war fought. Uh, you had Israel in the middle and you had Egypt and Syria on uh, either side of it. What had happened was that, you know, in the, in the Six Day War, 1967, the, uh, the Israelis captured the uh, Sinai Peninsula, Gaza Strip, West Bank, East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights. Now, uh, six years later, you know, the, uh, there was the new president of Egypt. His name was Anwar Sadat. Um, he wanted to reclaim the Sinai. He wanted the Sinai back to Egypt. And so they decided that uh, Egypt and Syria decided they were going to attack Israel on its holiest day. And they attacked at 2 p.m. That way, neither, neither end would have the uh, disadvantage of having the sun in their eyes. So 2 p.m. they attacked. Uh, the Israelis were overwhelmed. The, uh, the Egyptians and the Syrians both were able to cross the frontier capture uh, big chunks of the Suez, capture parts of the Golan Heights. Uh, it, it took three weeks for the Israelis to fight back and, re and not, they weren't able to recapture everything, but they were actually able to you know, capture big chunks of Egyptian and Syrian territory. Um, you know, there was a lot of pressure, uh, Henry Kissinger, to try to get all, all three countries to stop fighting, uh, which, which they eventually did. Like I said, it, it took three weeks and they were able to keep what they held, but Eventually, you know, it led to the uh, the peace agreements, the Camp David peace accords uh, between uh, Egypt and Israel when Menachem Begin of Israel and uh, Anwar Sadat of, Sir, of, uh, of Egypt uh, signed the, uh, the peace agreement. Ironically, um, 40 years ago to the day on October the 6th, uh, about eight years after the Yom Kippur War, on October 6th, 1981, three days before your birthday, while they were trying to celebrate the Yom Kippur War, Anwar Sadat was assassinated by the Muslim Brotherhood. There you go. There's my This Week in History. That is, uh, that is some intense This Week in History. Thank you for that. Anytime. Anytime.
All right. Well, yeah. that was This Week in History. All right, everyone, for the most important part of the podcast, we are about to enter into the interview section, and we've got a very special guest on the show, actually a good friend of uh, Alan and mine. His name is Denton Florian. He is the executive producer of the five-time Emmy Award-winning documentary, Sam Houston, American Statesman, Soldier, and Pioneer. Denton, how are you doing, man? I'm doing good. Good to be with you guys. It is great to have you. Um, You know... I think the last time us three were together, uh, you were one of the guest speakers for our very first uh, history event. That went very well. I uh, got a lot of great compliments on that. Oh, that was a fun night. That it was. And uh, I know that you went home um, and me and Alan, Jody Ginn and Stephen Harden went out and got completely hammered. Uh <laughs> <laughs> one of the local bars. Uh, oh, yeah. Man. I suspected as much. You know? <laughs> of course. Yeah. Wild times. Definitely. So. Hey, I, I only drank Dr. Pepper. So don't uh, don't get me involved in this. Yeah. With a splash of <laughs> God only knows what. Well, hey, man. Um, all right. So this is it's a pretty touchy conversation. And it's a conversation that definitely has to be had. Um, it's interesting that was it two weeks ago, we had Dr. Mary Graybar on, uh, on the line and she was talking about her new book, debunking the 1619 project. And we're here talking about this, uh, recent book that came out, um, called forget the Alamo. Um, I got a question much like the, the 1619 project, forget the Alamo is trying to reframe Texas history and undo what they call the Alamo myth. Now, how are they trying to do this, one, and what do they get right and what do they get wrong? Well, it's interesting you bring up the 1619 Project, Dustin, because the uh, I think the premise of the 1619 Project is that the American Revolution was started and fought for the purpose of preserving slavery. That's the, that was the uh, beginning of the United States, is their assertion. And it's really just kind of a cut and paste operation from the 1619 project. You know, they've taken that and applied it to the Texas Revolution, saying that uh, same thing in Texas, that the purpose of the Texas Revolution was to uh, protect, preserve and expand slavery, um, which is nonsense. I mean, that doesn't mean that slavery wasn't in Texas uh, or anything else or that it wasn't evil. Of course it was. But uh that's very different from saying that's what motivated the people to fight. Um, what I think what they, uh, what they got in the book that was true, uh, is not new information. Uh, people have been, you know, the, for example, Travis's line in the sand, they want to make a big deal out of Travis's line in the sand. First place I'd say it's irrelevant, uh, whether he drew the line or not. Uh, but, that's not new. People have been writing about that for a long time. Um, and and if, if that's the concession they're looking for, fine. Uh, you know, it, it may have happened. We don't know that it didn't, but it probably didn't. I think most historians would tell you that, uh, that that's probably a, uh, an embellishment. The other thing, another thing they say, I believe, is um, that, um, uh, you know, how did Davy Crockett die? Did he go down swinging? Uh, it's very important to them to point out in the movie that, that, that he went down swinging and how that's absolutely not true. Um, you know, probably not. Um, there's been some recent work on that. And, but that's not new information. Um, historians have been writing about that for a while. So the things that they say, their main assertions, so the things that they say are new or, or, or that are true in the book are, are not new. And the things that they, their main assertions that they make are demonstrably false. So, you know, they get it wrong on both ends. So what are some of the things that they do get wrong in this book? And is it strictly uh, sort of just taking the copy paste 1619 project that it was all about slavery? Um, That's their, as I read it, that's their main assertion. Yeah. Is that it was all about slavery. Um, And it's just, not they need to say that but i you know i think as i read this this is not a book about history this is not a history book this is a book about politics 
this they have a different purpose. This is a political book, and I, uh, it, th their assertions are historical nonsense, um, and uh, and I don't think it'll be on the stage for very long. I think you know this will, this book will will disappear, and and people will move on. It'll be uh, at probably located at uh, Alan's favorite uh, half price bookstore in no time in no time at all so my next question is the 1690 well, let me project. let me say let me say one thing real quick dustin you know listen it's on the new york times bestseller list oh yeah so i mean i don't want to poo poo the thing they, they've gotten they've made a lot of money uh and a lot of this is you know a lot of this race baiting stuff is about making money and they've done a great job at, at, at making money on it but that also kind of flies in the face of their their complaints that they're they're being censored and everything, you know, I'm like, okay, you've got a New York Times bestseller that is in every bookstore in Texas and that is in every library in Texas and you're being censored, you know, how does that work exactly? Um, yeah, it is, it is quite silly to even make that, um, that assertion it, because the media outlets have been all over this book. Yeah, they're everywhere. So, you know, and obviously they're part of, you know, one of the writers used to be with the Wall Street Journal and San Antonio Express, you know, the Dallas Morning News, like NPR is all over this. Um, and so it's not there's no censorship that's going on, except to the point where I believe um, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick and Greg Abbott were like, look, you know, this type of stuff doesn't need to be propagated because it's based on fallacies. Um, and I think that, you know, rightly or wrongly, um, it's one of those things that really bugs me when people say, well, this is a conversation that needs to be had. And it's like, well, if the conversation is based on a lie, then there is no point in having the conversation because that's not a conversation unless you have two liars, uh, going at it and either disagreeing based on lies or you know, just agreeing on a lie. That's what doesn't make any sense to me is, you know, oh, you know, this is the type of conversation that needs to be had. And I'm like, no, good founded conversations that are based on facts um, or at least theories that you can definitely back up uh, with some stuff. But this is just one of those things where you're force feeding uh, the conversation. Well, but Dustin, they say they're trying to start a conversation, but then they won't agree to have one. You know, they say they welcome a debate, but they won't accept an invitation to have one. Uh, I told Jerry Patterson, um, you know, in, in right after the book came out, when I first learned about this, <clears throat> um, I said, they're, they're not going to debate. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to have an event or sponsor a, uh, I'm going to get somebody, I'm going to organize a, a debate where he said, they're not going to debate. They're not going. He said, "Why not?" I said, "Because the woke don't debate. That's not what they do. Um, they slander, and uh, th they come in, make the hit, and then cut out. You know, uh, they're not going to subject themselves to a civil conversation. Um, they're not going to subject themselves to cross examination, where people who know the facts and know what they're talking about can can uh, uh, ask them tough questions, uh, can put facts in front of them." It's just, they're never going to do that. And I think I know why, uh, I probably wouldn't either, but it's just, it's just not the way they operate. They're not going to do that. You know, this is very similar to how Nicole Hannah Jones, uh, approached, uh, the situation when she was asked, Hey, let's, let's have a debate or, you know, let's get together and with some historians and See if you can stand on your own two feet on what you've claimed in the 1619 Project. And obviously, she didn't. She would go to panel discussions and places where she was accepted with open arms and given softball questions. Um, and speaking of that, the 1619 Project was headed by Nicole Hannah-Jones, editor, journalist um, for the New York Times, along with other journalists, poets, and creators, uh, like you know, creative types. Uh, four of the contributors were, the, were historians, but their specialties were not on slavery. So Forget the Alamo was written by three journalists. And plenty of journalists have written historical pieces, but typically because they were there or it was an investigative piece. So should journalists be trusted 
to rewrite decades, if not at times, centuries worth of historical scholarship? And do they even have the training to do such a thing? Well, they no, they don't have the training to do that. I mean, they make a lot of amateurish mistakes, but yeah, they're free to write a book. They're free to write whatever they want. I would say that uh, if they do, they shouldn't be afraid of uh, scrutiny. They shouldn't be afraid to, you know, historians write things and it's all subject to peer review, right? You put it out there, you publish something and and other people look at it and, and weigh in on it. I think the critics, which is another thing, you know, they, you know, Dustin, they say that um, the our, our only criticism is the only people that are critical of this are right wingers. Um, they kind of put you in that box in that category. But a bunch of historians wrote a letter about the 1619 project that said, wait a minute, a couple of them from Princeton, you know, one of them from uh, Texas State University. Uh, I, I doubt that uh, these are people who carry any water for the right wing. Uh, most historians are on the left. The overwhelming majority of historians are on the left. I won't say all of them, um, but they're good historians. They're professionals. And they said, wait a minute, this is the, I think they called it the displacement of, uh, uh, the displacement of, of historical understanding with ideology or, or something very close to that. Uh, is what they said. So it's just simply not true that the people, all the people that are critical uh, of their book are, are right-wing, you know, ideologues. Uh, it's just, just demonstrably false. Well, I wanted to, I want to bring up the, the race baiting subject. And I, I was also going to mention that this also reminds me of Al Gore when he did his uh, Inconvenient Truth. Uh, I don't recall ever seeing him in a debate. Um, but what I, what I wanted to mention is, is okay, today is, uh, the day we're recording this is October 2nd, which is the anniversary of the Battle of Gonzales. Uh, for many of our audience who don't know, that is those were the first shots that were fired for the Texas Revolution. And uh, that's where the come and take it uh, flag and cannon came in. But after the Battle of Gonzales and the, um, the Mexican soldiers uh, retreated back to uh, San Antonio, which at the time was called Bejar. Um, they had what was called the Siege of Bejar, which took place. You had a Texas force, which lasted about two months. You had a, a Texas force of about somewhere between four to 600, depending on who you talk to. Um, these were the attacking Texas rebels. Now, um, I, was, I was doing a little bit of research on the numbers. Now, there were about approximately 160 Tejanos who took part in this battle. Right. So that's, if you, depending on whether it's four to 600, that's between 27 to 40, 27% to 40% of the attacking force who would, we're talking attacking the Mexican army. Now, based on the population estimates between 1834 and 1836, they, they really don't know the exact numbers, but I have seen that the, that the Tejanos their population remained stagnant, somewhere between three to 4,000. But the, the Anglo and the Black that were coming in from the United States was somewhere between 20,700 and 30,000, and it was continuing to grow. Mm -hmm. So if you look at those numbers, the, the, the Tejano population in Texas was somewhere between nine to 16%. Yet, when they attacked the Mexican army in Bejar, it was 27 to 40% Tejano participation in that battle. So percentage-wise, we're talking more Tejanos uh, than Anglos. So what, I mean, what are your thoughts on the Tejano involvement and how does this push against the writer's racially uh, motivated narrative? Well, it's a great, you're absolutely right. I, I don't know this, the precise percentages that you're talking about, but it's absolutely a fact that the Tejano population in Texas the participated in, in the Texas Revolution at about the same percentage or greater uh, than the Anglos. Now, there were a lot more Anglos, as you said. There were, the numbers are different because, you know, all these Anglos were pouring in from uh, into East Texas from the United States. So, so, so there was a lot more of them. But the, uh, as a percentage of their population, it's uh, comparable or greater. Yes, yeah, certainly. So if this was all about white supremacy, why are those people fighting? Um, you know, when Santa Ana took over, he, uh, 
he, he ran as a state's rights guy, a man of the people and all this kind of thing. And the first thing he did is abolish the Constitution of 1824 that everybody was living under. And he said and he declared himself to be a dictator. And um, uh, Zacatecas rebelled and he sent his troops in there, killed 5,000 Mexican citizens. All these other Mexican states rebelled. Uh, uh, Tamaulipas, Nuevo León, uh, Yucatan, you know, Tabasco, I mean, several of them. And I don't think that the Mexican citizens who were living in the Mexican interior in all these other states that rebelled, I think you'd have a pretty hard argument to say that all those people were white supremacists. You know, it's just not the case. So you got to say, why were they rebelling? Well, their legislatures were disbanded. Their governors were replaced with, their elected governors were replaced with political appointees. Um, you know, their autonomy was taken away, particularly the, the, the Tejanos, the Mexican citizens born in Texas. Uh, they, did, they lost local control. They, they didn't have their political autonomy. They had to go all the way to Mexico City to get things done or to get, have decisions made on their behalf and so on. And, you know, to say that, oh, it was all about slavery is just um, a, a gross oversimplification of what was going on, which... You know, it, it is, if you read in, in this book, it, uh, it is a, a rather amateurish argument and, and mistake. It, you know, it's a, the, the straw man fallacy where they will uh, say something that is a gross oversimplification. Then they will refute that oversimplification and make the claim that they've refuted your argument when in fact, they've never heard your argument. They haven't refuted anything that you said. They refuted their own oversimplification or they'll make some gross exaggeration. They'll exaggerate something greatly and then you know, knock down that exaggerated argument and claim they knocked down your argument. They haven't heard your argument. Uh, they haven't done any such thing. Um, they're, they, they love to talk about the John Wayne movie. They love to talk about the Alamo and I don't know why that's important, um, but they will say, well, the Davy Crockett didn't go down swinging like uh, John Wayne did in the movie. And um, uh, as I've already said, that's not new information, um, but they will tie people who are critical of their work to that argument. And, uh, you know, they'll, they'll shoot down some Hollywood artistic license or some embellished story that Hollywood did. What do I care what Hollywood did? Um, but they'll shoot that down and then they'll say, see, also all these other guys are wrong. Um, it's really irrelevant what Hollywood did or didn't do. Um, it, um, so that, I, I think it's a dis disingenuous way to go about the argument and to to make a claim that's a strong, it's a classic straw man argument. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Zacatecas and I think Yucatan. Um, I, I don't think our, our audience really understands how much of an impact the Federalists versus the Centralists was a factor in all that went on in Mexico. Um, you, know, you, you, you know, Mexico became an empire in 1821 and then shortly after that, they lost all of Central America all the way to the Panama the Panamanian border, the Costa Rican Panamanian border. So could you better explain to our audience the Federalist versus the Centralist factor and why it was so important? And as well as, you know, you, you did mention that Santa Ana came out as a state's right and then he switched. Um, if, you, if you could give a little bit more uh, detail about what went on so that people can, can really understand the context and what was going on and, and why the, Tex, the Texians considered themselves Federalists, as well as, uh, you know, uh, you had, uh, was it De Zavala and Juan Seguin, if you could shed light on the fe The Federalists were, were, you know, basically, I would say, uh, states' rights people. The Federalists uh, were arguing for local control. Um, they were, and, and Santa Ana got elected as a federalist. He got elected, as I said, as a man of the people, small government and all that. The centralists were for central command of the economy, of people's rights, of, of all kinds of things. I think, uh, you know, some of your other historians could, could uh, talk about that, you know, in much more detail and perhaps give you a better answer. But, you know, the 25,000 foot view of that is that the federalists were, were um, small government states rights people and the centralists were not and uh, Santa Ana put himself forward as one thing and once he got elected he he uh, governed quite differently and so 
everybody in tech, the Anglos in Texas were, were operating under this constitution that suddenly was ripped out from underneath them. And, um, you know, that's a problem. They had, as I said, as I said before, they had a great deal. They, they had very low taxes. They had a lot of land and um, uh, suddenly that was all turned upside down and, and they had a, they had a problem with it. You know, um, I think a, one of uh, a primary issue with people who um, read history or, you know, sometimes even write history is that they don't put themselves in those people's shoes from however far back. Um, but the reaction from the Federalists, the Texians, the Tejanos, that reaction to what Santa Ana did is universal and timeless. That's not, oh, well, that was then. No, this was a fight against tyranny. Um, and a lot of people sort of say, well, you know, and try to blame it on something else. I think people need to put it in perspective of, of today. What if there was a Santa Ana moment that happened today here in the United States? What do you think people's reaction would be if all of a sudden Biden or, you know, had, had Trump or whatever future president uh, were to say, you know what, forget the Constitution, forget your state legislatures, your governors are all gone, everything is going to be centralized and everything is going to be done in Washington, D.C. What, what, what would the appropriate reaction be? Well, it's, uh, you know, clearly that's a, a hypothetical and it's always kind of dangerous to play what if. Uh, I think, I, you know, frankly, I think you'd have a, a a sizable percentage of people that would think that was reasonable and be okay with it. Now, I don't, I don't think 30 years ago, you'd get that reaction. Um, there would certainly, I think be uh, a bunch of people that said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, but you know, these things happen slowly over time, you know, uh, as, as Jefferson said, and, and many of the founders said, you lose your rights gradually over time. It's the frog in the water, uh, story. So, um, We've already lost a tremendous amount of our liberty, and uh, the difficulty is going to be getting it back. Now, um, I was uh, reading one of uh, Dr. Stephen Harden's books. Uh, it's called the, uh, the Texas Macabre. And uh, in it, I read an interesting passage. The, uh, now, when Santa Ana left for Texas, he left, uh, he, he left an acting president behind in Mexico City. His name was Miguel Barragan. Now, Barragan blamed the Texas rebellion on what Dr. Hardin termed gringo ingratitude. And these were Barragan's words. He stated, to the Texas colonist, the word Mexican is and has been an execrable word. Now, when I read Barragan's statement, um, I see some of the, um, the race baiting woke cancel culture uh, politics that you know that we see today that's uh, that's dividing Americans. You know, I mean, everything it's a false narrative based on race. Now, what are your thoughts amidst all the growing uh, woke cancel culture that we're seeing in this country that's targeting Anglo Europeans, Western civilization, uh, the U.S., and uh, now Texas? Um, I mean, is that what's going to make books like Forget the Alamo possible? And can we expect more? Because I saw on Amazon that it, that's rated number one in Mexico. Oh yeah, you're not, you're gonna see a lot more of it, you know, because it pays. Um, you know, you can make a lot of money uh, race baiting. And I think uh, um, it's certainly not Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream. It wasn't Dr. King's dream that we all be divided according to race. Um, I just saw in the news last week, I think it was where, uh, there's a university up in Washington that has uh, separate black housing for the for the uh, black students up there, uh, segregated housing, you know, and so it makes me guess, well, well, what's next? Water fountains and bathrooms. And, you know, I thought we decided a long time ago that was a bad idea. Uh, but here it is again. So we're going backwards. And that's not unifying. It is not uh, something that's going to uh, it's very different from us all being considered equal under the law and where your skin color doesn't matter. Uh, I can't, quite frankly, I can't think of anything that would describe me um, more, uh, that's more insignificant to describe me than the color of my skin. Uh, it says absolutely nothing about me as a person. It says nothing about my 
my character, says nothing about my, my education, my friends, my travels, my interests, my, uh, my hobbies, you know, whatever, says nothing about that. But for some people, that is the most dominant characteristic. That is the single distinguishing characteristic of somebody is the color of their skin. That also happens to be the view of the KKK. Okay. And when you, when, when like this, when you see people who see all of life through the lens of race, you get books like this. You know, back to, uh, I just wanted to reiterate before I get to my last question. Um, as far as if we were, we're, um, what is it? 1836 and we're in, you know, 2021. So, you know, a little less than 200 years later, you know, I don't think we look at the reaction of the Texians as overblown for the for the very point of it being that there were massacres taking place in various cities that Santa Ana was going through to sort of quell the rebellions. It was well, we can eat, we have one of three options, and that is we just get the heck out of Texas altogether and go back to, you know, and go to America. Or we just say, okay, Santa Ana, you're the dictator, and we will abide under your tyranny, which goes completely against everything that w is American. Um, or three, we stand here and fight. I don't think we look at, I don't think people would look at it if it came down to something like that happening here in the States, modern day, and, you know, you having one of those three options, either get out of here, uh, abide under tyranny, or, or fight back. And, you know, I think you have an extremely valid point, especially now, um, that there would probably be a sizable portion of the population that would be like, okay, whatever, didn't know the Constitution anyways. Um, and if you don't, if you don't value liberty, it, you will lose it. It'll either be taken away from you by force, or you'll surrender it yourself because you don't know any better. You know, the history of the world, as I've said, is not liberty. The history of the world is slavery and despotism and tyranny. Um, uh, that was common. Slavery was universal. It was on every continent. It was among every people. We kind of think of slavery in the United States in, in racial terms, because that was the American experience. It was a racial thing. That wasn't the case of slavery worldwide. Certainly wasn't the case with the Mongolians or the Asians or in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, you know, you have, uh, look, you have 700,000 slaves right now in Africa held by other Africans. So, um, we kind of think of it in racial terms, but it's that's not the history of the world. It's not. And we live in this little bubble where we think that uh, this is normal. We've got our 250 years or whatever. Uh, this is weird. This is not normal. This is very abnormal. Um, and, and perhaps a step forward, a unifying thing would be that all of us could say, look, there is still slavery. It's not sanctioned worldwide. It's not accepted as the norm, but it still exists. We have uh, people, human trafficking taking place right under our noses here in the United States. So maybe all of us could recognize that and say, you know what, we've still got a problem and let's work together to solve that. That's something we can do on our watch. And we'll worry about what happened 200 years ago later, maybe, but we got a problem right now. So why don't we come together and agree that we're going to stamp this out. That would be a positive thing. Yeah. Well said. Well said indeed. All right, Denton, uh, last question. Um, been a fantastic conversation as I knew it would be. Um, last question. What are some of your book recommendations on the history of Texas and in particular the history of the Alamo? Oh, uh, you know, on the Alamo, if I had to pick one, I'd probably pick James Crisp's book, uh, Sleuthing the Alamo. Uh, it's a marvelous little collection of essays, really, where he, he talks about racism and he talks about um, uh, how Crockett died. What is the research? You know, he gets into De La Pena's diary and all that. that that's probably the first thing that I would go to on the Alamo. Um, the, uh, there's several others, you know, listen, Dr. Randolph Campbell has a number of the books on slavery. If you want to know about slavery. He is the go-to guy on slavery, Dr. Campbell. He wrote uh, Empire for Slavery, uh, the Peculiar Institution in Texas. 
And, um, and by the way, the guy that wrote, literally wrote the book on slavery in Texas is also the guy who said slavery is not what this was all about in Texas, the Texas Revolution. That was not the central issue. Uh, you know, he said that on page 48 of his book. I've got his book on, on my bookshelf. I've read it twice. Uh, so some of these guys have a problem when, when they say, oh, all the, all the renowned historians agree with us. I'm sorry they don't. Well, all right, Denton. Hey, man. Um, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. We thank you very much for, for being on the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. It's great to see you guys again. Um, you know, this is productive. I wish we could have a, an open conversation. Uh, you know, look, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe these guys will agree to come to the table. I think if they're honest brokers, they would. It'd be great to have a, uh, a, a fair and professional conversation about some of these things. You got it, man. I very much so. appreciate you having us on, uh, having with us on the show. Having with us on our show. What did you just say, Alan? My God. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Denton Florian. I know Alan and I did. Alan, um, one, what did you think about the conversation? And two, I believe you have some additional comments as far as some of the things that we were talking about. Well, you know, I, I enjoyed talking with him. I, I saw him on a couple of interviews uh, talking about this very subject. And I really would love to see him in a debate with the authors of that book. I, I just I don't see it happening. It's kind of like Al Gore. Al Gore has not debated uh, any scientist in, in terms of the uh, the whole global warming debate. Well, do you so, think do you think Al Gore isn't doing that because I mean, one, he's very busy and two, with his schedule, it'd be pretty inconvenient. That, yes. And uh, also he's liking in truth, but that's that's another story. So, all right, now, uh, some of the points that I wanted to make out, and I, I didn't want to just throw these at him because, um, we, you know, we had some specific questions that we wanted to ask. But, but for our audience, I wanted to point out a few things in terms of how a lot of people are sitting, or at least like some of these authors and their advocates are sitting saying, uh, white supremacy, white supremacy is all about white supremacy. I want to point out a few things. Um, uh, now, I mentioned the Battle of Behar. Now, Ben Milam was one of the guys that led that attack, and he, he was killed at that battle. Um, he had assisted the Mexicans in their war of independence against Spain. So, you know, he was fighting for Mexico. Now, th this was before, you know, Stephen F. Austin showed up with, uh, with his colonists, so he was not fighting for any whites. Um, and, and he later on, he served as a colonel in the Mexican army after the Constitution of 1824 was uh, was written. Uh, Jim Bowie, or Bowie, however you want to pronounce him. Now, he was a business partner of Juan Martin D. and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, Vera Mendy. Uh, not only was he a business partner of his, he was his son-in-law. That's right. He married his daughter. Uh, her name was Maria Ursula or Ursula de Veramundi, Veramundi. Try to say that really, really quick. Um, David Crockett and Sam Houston. Now they were both pretty much ostracized for defending the Indians. They, you know, uh, Sam Houston was a protege of Andrew Jackson, but you know, at the same time, you know, not a, not a big fan of some of the Indian policies. And even, you know, even Sam Houston, uh, he spoke out against uh, like the uh, was it the Kansas Missouri Act, which was going to expand slavery. The Kansas so, Nebraska the Kansas Nebraska Act was it the Kansas yeah Kansas Nebraska Act. What did I say? Kansas Missouri. Yeah yeah I'm sorry the Kansas Nebraska Act which uh, which actually uh, abrogated I guess the uh, Missouri Compromise. But uh, but that you know that's something that's written about in uh, Profiles in Courage by John F Kennedy. He talks about Sam Houston speaking out against the Kansas-Nebraska Act. I guess if they would have come up with the Kansas-Missouri Act, it would have been a compromise within a compromise within a compromise. All right. Thank, thank you there, uh, Dr. Kevorkian. <laughs> well, yeah, but, you know, you have that and then you have, you know, and he worked with the Cherokees. Sam Houston did. He's a big fan of the Cherokees. And and then, you know, you had David Crockett. He was against the uh, the Indian Removal Act. So it doesn't sound like white supremacy to me. Uh, Stephen F. Austin, the father of Texas, he was uh, very pro-Mexico. He loved Mexico. He, he was not for any type of rebellion. He was not for Texas independence. 
he was very much very pro-Mexico, uh, served as an empresario. Uh, but what changed was when he was uh, imprisoned and he saw the changes San, uh, Santa Ana was doing and turning Mexico from a, uh, from a United States of Mexico to a dictatorship at the hands of Sam Houston, at the hands of uh, Santa Ana. Uh, let's see, now the Texians themselves, they supported the 1824 constitution. I mean, they had it well, they, they were living very well in Texas. Land was cheap, they were very liberal government. I mean, that, that they were federalists. Uh, the Tejanos, like I mentioned, De Zavala, who was the first provisional vice president. I think his name is Lorenzo de Zavala. You had Juan Seguin, all these guys. And, and believe me, there, there's a whole slew of, of, of people. There's, there's even a book uh, about the Tejano participation in the Texas Revolution. Now, you know, Percentage-wise, more Tejanos participated in the fight than, than the Anglos in terms of, of the percentage of population. Um, now that now the Tejanos themselves, and you had Mexicans from various regions and provinces throughout Mexico, all were, um, they were in revolt, wars of secession. It was going on all over Mexico. You had, uh, like we mentioned, Zacatecas. Um, you know, San, Santa Ana went there and he brutalized the people of Zacatecas. You had Yucatan. You had, I mean, you had, you had like almost about a dozen different provinces and states within Mexico that revolted. Um, some of them, um, you know, Yucatan was an independent country for, for quite some time. So, you know, they opposed the centralist policies. You know, it'd be like all policy. We, we, we don't have a how Texas legislation. We don't have, you know, the 50 legislations, no governors. All power now would be concentrated in Washington, D.C. Now, in 1828, there was something known as the Tehran Expedition. And that was led by General Manuel de... Uh, Demir and Tehran. Now he brought concerns about the growing Anglo population. This, the Tejano population in Texas was very stagnant, but in 1828 he showed up and he was he was quite alarmed, and he didn't like the fact that there were so many Anglo's living in in the state of Texas. So um, you know his his actions. And his, his beliefs led to what was known as the April 6, 1830 laws that targeted Anglos. So, you know, if you're going to talk about, well, you know, racism, you know, that was that was kind of racist themselves. You know, they 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 invited the Anglos to Texas. They wanted the Anglos there because they wanted them to, you know, uh, make Texas product, productive. And at the same time, they wanted somebody to fight the Native Americans because the Native Americans were attacking the Mexicans. So, you know. Something, just something to think about. Um, yeah, the, yeah, the Native Americans, they frequently attack the Mexicans. They, they attack the outposts. And, uh, you know, the Mexicans felt that Anglo assistance was needed to tame the uh, frontier. So I wanted to mention that. Just something to think about before, you know, if people are going to start saying, well, you know, they have the whites, 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 Anglos, 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 they're racist, blah, blah, blah. You know, the... Uh, Mexico, they were doing they were doing things themselves targeting Anglos. So, but you know, if you go into Texas, you had Anglos and you had Tejanos fighting side by side. You know, it, it's something. You know, you, 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 it's a false narrative to sit and say that this was all about white supremacy. You had Tejanos who were killed at the Alamo. Fighting with David Crockett and Dave and Jim Bowie and William Travis, you had Tejanos there. You had some of San Juan, San uh, uh, Juan Seguin's men, and they hated the centralists. So, one of the other things that uh, continues to get brought up is the whole slavery issue for Texas. It's like the Texians had already figured out a workaround by turning their slaves into indentured servants, and they were able to keep their slaves by labeling them indentured servants and so it's like well no they did it it's sort of the whole like denton was saying at the beginning you know the 1619 project said oh the american revolution was fought to protect slavery it's like no it wasn't it, it, just chronologically that doesn't make any sense and and two texas didn't uh do that either because one they had already found out a workaround Mexico was like, hey, things are going well in Texas. The, the Texans are, are doing well and providing a good economy. But 
all of a sudden, Santa Ana does this stupid decision of saying, okay, what you're used to generationally as an American moving into Mexico, what you're used to and what really the only reason that you came here was because you weren't going to be living under a dictatorship and you would have plenty of land. Um, that's all gone away now. So it's, it's, it's an, a poorly formulated argument that continues to get bought by people who are either ignorant because they haven't, you know, studied and they're just being shown this sort of like when kids go to school and they're just told by a teacher, Hey, this is what happened. And when you look into it, like, no, that's not really what happened. Or people who are purposely ignorant and they don't want to find out the information or people who are just on an agenda. Well, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people just don't understand that when, when Mexico became independent, it, it was an empire, it had an emperor and it stretched, uh, it, it stretched, you know, northward all the way to what's the Oregon border and it stretched southward to the Costa Rican Panamanian border. And, you know, a lot of the, you know, they didn't all call themselves Mexicans. You, you had Native Americans, you, you know, the people of, that are modern day Central America, they left. They left after 1820, was it 1823, because they felt like, you know, we're not, we have nothing in common with the government of Mexico City. So, you know, Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, uh, Honduras, all those countries split from Mexico because they wanted autonomy. And, you know, many of the outlying provinces of Mexico felt the same way. You know, we don't think the same way as as the people who were trained with, the, say, the Spanish Royal Army. We think things differently. They wanted autonomy. They wanted uh, they were federalists. They, it's kind of like how, you know, California, Texas, uh, Vermont, we all think differently. We don't want all power concentrated in D.C. It's what it's becoming. But that's not how it started out. But, you know, that that's what happened in Mexico. And, and people have got to understand that from the beginning throughout Mexico's history, even after the Texas Revolution, far beyond afterwards, there had been civil wars between the Federalists and the Centralists. And Texas had nothing to do with it in terms of instigating it. Texas was just a part of it. They participated in it. They, they seceded like se several of the others. The difference is, is, is that when, when Mexican army invaded, the Texas army fought back and actually won. That's the difference between Texas and some of the other provinces that rebelled and seceded from Mexico. Yeah, everybody hates uh, everybody hates the new everybody hates Tom Brady because he's always winning, and and you know people just love to hate winners. Hey, we're Texans, we're winners. That's what we do. Now, I'm not talking about Texans from a football perspective. Jeez, no. Louise. What a joke of an organization. All right, let's move on. Let's finish up the show. Book and movie recommendation. Uh, I think we've got some really good ones. Look, man, I know you prob you may get a little irritated, but it doesn't really matter to me as it never has. Um, <laughs> it is October. So October is the month one of my birthday. Actually, it is a week from today. And this is the final week in my 30s. What a travesty. Ladies and gentlemen, it is sickening what's going on in my life. Um, it's October. Second favorite holiday of the year, Halloween. So it's going to be Halloween-related movie recommendations for sure. But my book recommendation is a book called The Devil in the White City. Um, this is referencing what uh, This Week in History, I referenced it earlier. Um, this is by one of my favorite authors, Eric Larson. Um, and it is about... The time when Chicago is getting uh, the World's Fair done and it they're doing all of this incredible work. But at the same time, there is a serial killer. America's first serial killer, H.H. H. Holmes, is doing his terrible best uh, to murder as many women as possible. So uh, it is trying to figure that out and then also build the World's Fair. And Eric Larson does always a phenomenal job of taking two separate narratives and combining them uh, into one, uh, narrative, uh, one of my favorite, uh, his, historical authors. Uh, so if you haven't read it, go check it out. Uh, he's got a number of books, uh, and one Texas related Isaac storm about the hurricane, 
uh, the Galveston hurricane, which I know you read and you, you we talked about that is a great book too. So, all right, my uh, movie recommendation, and so help me God, if you say the original, I'm gonna I'm gonna reach over and slap you. All right, the thing, it is the original, except it's not the original. Uh, the thing, it's the 1982 version, The Thing with Kurt Russell. A uh, few other well-known actors from back in the day, Wilfred Brimley, Wilfred Brimley, uh, Donald Moffat, and the man with the voice, Keith David. Love his voice, man. He's just really cool stuff. Um, now, speaking of movie recommendations, yeah, this is a really cool, fun movie, but I did watch, it's a, it's the great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. I did watch that the other night. Eh, really lightened my heart there. I'm done. I, I, I like that. I like the uh, the old Charlie Brown uh, cartoons. Do they Are they still showing them on TV or do you have to uh, purchase them now? I don't know. Um, probably, I don't know. I think that they... Yeah. I, I want to say that they stopped one year with the with the Thanksgiving because of white supremacy. It is subjugating all of us under its tyranny. But then I think last year, I think ABC or NBC, one of them decided to play it, I want to say. I don't know. Maybe they just thought, you know what? That was really stupid to do. So anyways, um, I don't know to answer your question. Well, I, I did purchase. Uh, there, there is a three. Uh, it's a it's a DVD set. Uh, uh, peanuts in the sixties and seventies. I think it's like three different uh, DVD sets. So it does have all those, uh, um, those, uh, peanuts, uh, cartoon, the Charlie Brown cartoons. Cause I, I did notice that there were two different Valentine, uh, uh, Charlie Brown cartoons. They created a second one. So yeah, if you ever get a chance, take a look, there's two different ones. All right. So for me, uh, book. This one right here, it's called The Documents of the Christian Church. The, this is the fourth edition. Uh, this was written by the late, or edited, I should say, by the late Henry Bettinson. And the person who took over uh, is Chris Maunder because uh, Bettinson uh, passed. But this has like, you know, these are the early documents of when the, when the Christian church began. So uh, um, I've not read the whole thing, but I have gone through it. it, it it's, um, you know, I've read excerpts here and there about um, Pelagius and the uh, the Nicene Creed and the, um, there's another creed that just really has just escaped my mind, but they're in here. So take a look at it. I think, uh, I think it's, a, it's a good reference book to have. I'm not going to recommend that you read it page to page, but you'll definitely want to read it uh, based on some of the documents that are in there. Uh, now, in terms of movie recommendations, um, I'm going to first mention, uh, we, we just had Denton Florian on with us. Um, now, his documentary, uh, uh, Sam Houston, uh, American Statesman, Soldier, and Pioneer, if you want a good documentary, I would say watch that. It, 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 it's, it's what, is it five episodes or? Um, I don't, I can't remember. It is a, it is a long. It's not long... like a two-hour documentary. It's a little bit longer than that. But I would, uh, uh, if you want something of history, I, I would recommend that. Now. In terms of, you know, with all the crap that's going on in the world today, if you want to have a little bit of fun, I always like to, every once in a while, watch the Road to Movies. Um, Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, and Dorothy L'Amour. You've got, like, you know, like Road to Morocco was the first one I saw. Um, you had Road to Bali, Road to Utopia, Road to Rio. So many of them, and I kind of, kind of lost track of them. I really like Road to Morocco. I think that was that was my favorite. But, you know, I mean, they're silly, they're stupid, but you know what? They're lighthearted, they're fun. And, uh, you know, how can you not like Bob Hope and Bing Crosby? And Dorothy L'Amour, she was, granted, yeah, she's no longer with us, but she was pretty hot in her days, so. Granted, she's no longer with us, as if Bob Hope and Bing Crosby are still with us. <laughs> well, I mean, if you're going to sit there and, you know, look at a uh, woman that's passed, you know, she was probably been 100 years by now. Yeah, I guess that's kind of sickening. But uh, <laughs> it's like, hey, look, it's like Gene Kelly, uh, not Grace Kelly. Grace Kelly was just an absolutely stunningly beautiful woman. Um, I don't know what she looks like now, but. Uh, you know, she's been dead for about 40, 39 years now. 
I remember when she died, 1982. Anyway, so yeah, there's that. So there you go. There's my uh, book and movie recommendations. Yeah, well, when you said Gene Kelly, I was like, um, Al? Grace oh, Kelly. Boy. Grace Kelly. Oh, Grace boy. Kelly. <laughs> how times, how times have changed. <laughs> All right, uh, so no show next week. We're not doing the podcast, although we may have something posted, uh, either a military interview or something along those lines. But it is going to be a weekend of pure out-and-out, unadulterated celebration of my 40th birthday, uh, which I purchased the 007 tickets, the new James Bond tickets. If And ladies and gentlemen, mark my words, if Alan does not show up because one of those tickets that I purchased was for him, obviously people are paying me back. I'm not, I'm not buying people gifts for my birthday. If he does not show up, we will talk about it. And it may be just me talking about it by myself because he may be joining Grace. There's a reason why I wouldn't be able to make it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. All right. How can people find us? You were so insensitive. You were so insensitive. I'm, I'm going to go tell my mother how insensitive you are towards her. She's go not tattle. going to like you. Go of tattle. Course, she'll, probably, she'll probably won't remember that conversation tomorrow, but that's another story. Speaking of insensitive, you are trash. Where can people find us? They can find us on Facebook. Be sure to like us. They can find us on Instagram. Be sure to follow us. And they can find us on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to us on YouTube. And you can also find us on our very own website, www.thesonsofhistory.com. Lots of stuff there, including our merchandise, past videos, writings, anything you want, it's in there. All right, ladies and gentlemen, make sure that you go do all of which Alan said. And maybe in two weeks from now... Uh, when we meet again, Alan will be with me instead of pretending like rain kept him at home. Um, really irritating, but I don't even want to deal with it right now. Let's just move on with the rest of our lives. Hope you have a great week.